You're listening to The Rewatchables 1999 from Luminary Media. Sorry I'm late. It took me a long time to get here. But I'm your host, Juliette Littman, and I'm joined by Amanda Dobbins and Bill Simmons. We are all Josie Grossy today, and we are breaking down Never Been Kissed. To sneak, to proceed quietly, to be the first to catch a special sneak preview. What's up, girlfriends? Of a comedy you'll never forget. Do you remember high school? (laughs) Tomorrow. Are you sure you're 17? I'm 17. (laughs) Drew Barrymore. Guy is totally crunching on you. Do I want to be crunched? Oh, Oh, yeah. Never been kissed. I was so cool. Rated PG-13. Sneak preview tomorrow. Check newspapers. What a film. Very tough. Is this the worst movie that we've ever had on the Rewatchables? I wanted to know if this was the worst movie of the last 20 years. <laughs> and I'm, it actually made me think we should do more of these kind of movies. The Unwatchables, as I think Craig said to me. I watched it with Zoe, who stormed out after an hour. Good for Zoe. Although she did tell me to buy it, so I know she, she <laughs> likes this movie. I think she was just tired. And she was just like, at some point, just looked at me and said, this isn't okay. Yeah. Because once it starts heating up with Michael Vartan as the teacher and the student, it's like, it was borderline inappropriate in 1999. It was a little flimsier back then, but it was still a little inappropriate. It was very inappropriate. Yeah. It, it's so inappropriate that they build it like an investigative journalism plot line into it. And there's the John C. Riley character being like, you got to get this guy. You got to pin him, which I had blocked out from my memory of this I movie. I did too. But, I, you know, and I I have a lot of thoughts about how this movie portrays journalism, and they're not positive. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but at least John C. Riley is in there being like, uh, this is the story, which it, technically it is. Yeah. Technically, that's the story. But this was, so we got to go backwards. This is the end of, I would say, a six-year run of rom-coms getting more and more ludicrous. Mm-hmm. and. The lead female characters in the rom-com becoming more and more pathetic, culminating in this movie. Yeah. Where I, I Drew Barrymore plays this character almost like she's drunk or she's had a head injury. She's just so unimpressive. And for an hour, she can't navigate anything. She's just completely overwhelmed. It's like, I can't believe you have a job. You c- could barely be a barista. Everyone also talks to her like there's something wrong with right. her. It's not just how she's acting, but the way she's received is also like there's something deeply wrong with her mentally or or otherwise. I don't know. It's deeply humiliating, which is, you know, thinking about her other rom-coms and particularly the romantic comedies she does with Sandler, there is like a daffiness and a goofiness. She never plays the like power woman in charge in New York City. That's not her mode, which is good, but... She really goes for it on this one. Well, they tried to do that with her in Fever Pitch. They made her, like, successful. And even in that, it was like, how is this person successful? (laughs) She's a complete disaster. Well, one of the things that's, like, kind of upsetting about this movie is that that this is the first one she executive produced through her company, Wildflower. Yeah. Uh, It was... It also seemed like it took a long time for them to make this movie, but she... (laughs) I wonder why. She was like, I... Seriously, I wonder why, though, because it's not particularly impressive. Yeah. But she said, like, in the press at the time and since, that she wanted to make it because it was a representation of how she felt as, like, a teenager and, like, at at this age. And I find that deeply sad and also not true because we knew about Drew Barrymore then and now that she was incredibly wild. She went to rehab and then she says she was committed to a mental institute when in her teens this is 10 years after that but it's not like she actually had any experience remotely like this like in a traditional no. high school no she did <laughs> probably never went to a high school no. so Our, her most realistic role was mad love right yeah where she's like going off the off the deep end for the entire movie in this very like kind of appealing way and I was like that's now you've tapped into it Drew our producer Craig said before this movie that it was like someone who had been homeschooled and never went to high school wrote this movie which in Spot a lot on. of ways Drew Barrymore never went to a traditional high school that I'm aware of so it is she is kind of like performing high school archetypes to a truly embarrassing degree it's one of the worst high school movies of all time it's also one of the worst rom-coms of all time and i think it was successful when it came out 
I think this movie did well. It, it did. It made $84.5 million it's worldwide on a $25 million budget. And it's one of her most successful movies to date. Can you guess how many stars Roger Ebert gave it? It had, I mean, one. Three. Three. Three what? stars. Yes, I know. It wasn't that poorly received at the time. It was not well received, but it wasn't like this is a shitty movie. No one see it. It was like, this is decent. Drew Barrymore has great comedic timing. Oh. I was dating my wife when this movie came out, and she liked the movie. I think this, but that, that's why I wanted to mention that part about that six-year run of rom-coms. They were, they were all ridiculous. They all were completely over yeah. the top. Yes. And then now we look back and we're like, man. Right. And also the teen movies of 1999, 10 Things I Hate About You, Cruel Intentions, ridiculous in its own way. I mean, I think Cruel Intentions is a good yeah. movie, but also problems within it, as we discussed. <laughs> American Pie, which— is a going classic. for it. And she's all that, which is also just on rewatch so upsetting in terms of yes. like how the teenagers speak to each other and how they're portrayed. It's offensive. I, I kind of, you know, I feel like in the 20 years since these movies, bullying has become a hotter topic and something people discuss a lot more. But I almost feel like teen movies introduce bullying in some way because it looked so stark in these movies that you were like, yes, that's that's wrong behavior, but it was treated like it was almost normal or something. It's also like it rips off 10 movies, like yes. the whole I made friend with somebody who's not popular and then I got seduced by the popular crowd. And basically Mean Girls is making fun of movies like this. Right. Well, I, watching this, I was like, oh, did Mean Girls rip off uh, Never Been Kissed? There are a lot of parallels. Or, I, or Mean Girls is a reaction to how bad Probably, Never Been Kissed was. But it's like from the the character who goes into the high school and like, you know, is trying yeah. is the outsider trying to understand the social mores, but like to the friend who is on the mathletes and tries to get her be on the mathletes. And then she has to realize she realizes she has to learn how to be cool. <laughs> and there's this scene at the mall where they pass each other and Lily Sobieski is on- doing Janice and she's doing Katie. I mean, it didn't steal from Mean Girls is much smarter and more sophisticated than this movie. But I was like, huh, didn't remember these parallels. Both in Chicago. I didn't remember this was a Chicago movie. By the way, that mall, very clearly the Glendale Galleria. Mm. Like, just couldn't be more clear. So you think either making fun of movies like Never Been Kissed or just flatly ripped Tina Fey saw this movie and was like, I'm just stealing all the beats of this and making a smarter version of it. I think it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Hmm. I also, while doing research for this, were you, you'll know this, Bill, and Juliet, I guess you'll know this as a Cameron Crowe head, but Cameron Crowe did this. He went undercover at a high school, and that's how he wrote Fast yeah. Times at Ridgemont High, which I had forgotten. Um, so it's definitely ripping off that. But he he was pretty close to the age range, right? Yeah, he was a lot younger because it was like at the beginning of his career right. when he was starting to write for Rolling Stone. He also, some crucial distinctions, used a different name <laughs> and had the per- permission of the principal and several instructors. But uh, you know, in terms of everything is ripping everything else off is all I wanted to say with this. Can we go back to how inappropriate it is that the teacher has the hots for his student? Like <laughs> nowadays, he would be... Just in Apple News. Yes. You'd just be a picture of him with a sad mugshot and probably a black eye. The other thing is, not to like be too specific, but how how did he become infatuated with her? Like they didn't spend that much time together. There's no like, there's no chemistry until they tell you there is. No. There's no build up to it. You know, I want a little bit more out of my inappropriate teacher student relationships. Do you like? Do you, did you find Michael Vartan attractive? You are setting me up because I already texted you this morning, being like, I'm ashamed to admit that I found Michael Vartan so attractive. My wife's thing was like, he's just too. He's so skinny. It's like. You could just nudge him and he'd fall over. He looks really young too. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, and also he, they put him in really baggy like clothes. Very, very nineties. Like he just he's not wearing like a tailored was he, outfit. Was he married to J- Jennifer Garner at this point? No, I think this was beforehand. Yeah, because that they, they on meet alias. on Alias, right? And that's Alias is after this. A few years later, yeah. Drew Barrymore complicated career. <laughs> so we so if we go to like the comeback version of the Drew Barrymore era which is basically, you know, mad love movies like that. And then she goes Scream 96, and Mm -hmm. she's the big kind of twist because everyone thinks she's the star of the movie, and then she's not. Then Wedding Singer with Sandler, and she's really good in that movie and really likable. And I remember thinking, like, that's 1998. Like, oh, yeah, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Drew Barrymore is like a star. There's no question. And then she just makes bad movies, really. Please respect Ever After, Bill. For a while. I don't like Ever After either. 
I'm really sorry. I, I think Charlie's Angels is another candidate for one of the worst movies the last 20 years. It starts out with LL Cool J on a plane. They parachute out. He jumps on somebody else's parachute. It lands. And then Drew Barrymore takes off mm -hmm. the LL Cool J mask. It is the dumbest opening scene you'll ever watch in a movie. I have not watched Charlie's Angels it's since horrible. it was released, but it meant a lot to me as a teenager. Well, when but it was that's released. just because you were young. No, I know, you didn't know but any I better. feel like I, I realize I've seen Never Been Kissed like probably five to seven times at least, which I, is very alarming when I think yeah. about young Amanda and what she was being exposed to yeah. and valuing. But all of these movies, when you're a teenager, I, it's just what I thought was good or what I was taught to think was good. That's the most depressing thing of all. Also, she was really famous. Like of all of these teen movies and rom-coms that we've mentioned, she's way more famous than most of the people except for like Julia Roberts and here's like why these. she was really famous because E.T. is one of the most popular movies of all time mm, yeah. and this is still in the nostalgia sweep out you know what my favorite Drew Barrymore movie is though what is it Irreconcilable Differences mm. you know why? why divorce movie oh I haven't seen that one do I need to you're, see that see I I might not have you on the Kramer versus Kramer I don't feel like you're a true divorce <laughs> consumer oh, okay first of all you're not I, a true divorce I movie am. consumer I've been, I am I just haven't seen that one that's only one of the pivotal divorce movies well, of the know 80s. I did that. Oh, I was, my parents were divorced yet. I wasn't allowed to, I was like four. I'm going to watch right. it. I'll, I'll send you, I'll send I'll you a book report. I'll look at your application again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, a great divorce this movie. Is like this, it was one of the major events in my life. You can't kick me off the podcast. Right, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Uh, notably, this was written by Abby Cohen and Mark Silverstein, who he's now married to Busy Phillips, I believe. Yeah. Can Ooh. I also give you, can, can we do the rest of their movie? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. They wrote this movie, and then they didn't write any movies for many years, about a decade. And then they wrote, he just saw that into you, Valentine's Day, The Vow, How to Be Single, and I Feel Pretty. So those are several popular movies that are also pretty appalling, except for he just saw that into you, which I really like. And um, just sort of genre mishmashes. Listen, if he's just not in the or Valentine's Day is on TV and my wife is in the room, everything stops. I really like he's just something to you. That, that format just works with certain people. My wife is one of them. I don't mind that format. I also think it's good for rewatching because you really can just catch like the five minutes. Be like, oh yeah, it's in this part. Incredibly underrated Ben Affleck performance in right. that movie. He's great. I think that this is like one of the toughest rom romantic comedy oeuvres. Like, Yes. In history. These are some of the worst movies I've ever seen. How to Be Single is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in theaters. It's I Feel so Pretty, horrible. which is the recent Amy Schumer movie where she gets hit on the head and is like, now I think I'm it's beautiful. And that was released in 2018. I don't really know what to say. This is, there's almost needs to be a name for the type, this type of movie. Yeah. The completely unredeeming female lead who can't stay out of her own way, but somehow finds love in the end. But this is, what was the first movie like that? Like, what started this? It wasn't when Harry met Sally. No, it was, Sally's was it, was very it redeeming. While, very while you were sleeping? No, she's delightful as well. No, she, she is delightful, but... but she's a maniac in that movie. Like, she's a <laughs> she wholesale lies. lunatic. <laughs> well, there's a difference what are you talking between, about? There's a difference between the premise being a nightmare, which is definitely true in While You Were Sleeping, where she, like, Pulls she lies like, to the family about yes, being and is like, fiance. I'm in love with a man in a coma, and then, no, wait, I'm in love with his brother. And but then also the performance itself being unlikable, or because Sandra Bullock and while you were sleeping, you're rooting for her despite your better instincts. Yeah, and I guess I mean you're rooting for Drew Barrymore, but you just feel bad about the whole situation in this movie. Well, my best friend's wedding is the ultimate. Why am I rooting for this horrible, right? <laughs> horrible, horrible person. I was gonna say that might be the like de defining movie of. But the that's genre. a great movie. It though. is great. Yeah, but she's also, irredeemable. I also root for her. But, but may like may, like the wedding planner is one. The, where J-Lo has to sabotage the yeah, wedding and I'm rooting really for bad. her in that as well. But she she bows out. She doesn't sabotage Right. It. That's also she true of my best friend's it. wedding. She is in redeemed ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the category, shall we? Yes. <laughs> Please. Uh, typically, we start with most rewatchable scene, which we will do here. But in this case, it's the it's the most rewatchably bad scenes. Like, you're just like, wait, what? This actually happened in this movie? And... It's the most, re most hate rewatchable scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I've I have a few contenders to throw out for starters. I think uh, in the back half of the movie, when David Arquette's character Rob is like just beside himself, angry at his sister for blowing his cover, which was supposed to revive his baseball career, and he's is, like thirty. Yes, and he's so mad at her, like kicking a dog when she's down. Uh, that that's a really tough one. Not really, Josie. How could you do this to me? I helped you. I got you everything you wanted. How do you repay me? 
You blow everything two days before the championship. I, I wasn't even thinking. No, you weren't. Should we do? Are we going to talk about Arquette now? We could, yes. Let's go ahead. Another actor who is one of those where he's like, is he playing this person drunk? As, oh, yeah. Or is like, is this person supposed to have a slight tinge of brain damage? Because that was like his screen persona. So seeing him face off with Drew Barrymore, who's another one, it's like, is she playing this person like they're a little bit brain damaged? And seeing them together, I thought was really kind of magical. I did kind of enjoy it. Well, maybe he thought just, you know, his uh, coming off of Scream, he just sort of plays this like weird, like kind of, I don't know what I'm doing here kind of guy. And just I think it, that just became it. who he was in real life eventually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, is he a good actor? Like, has no. He's no. never been good. No. He was likable there for three years. Yeah, he just, he seems like um, most 1999 category, just like he was there as a fixture, just being in really broad studio comedies, being kind of stoned. And and then we all moved on. It's a really hard one to explain. It's just, it's nepotism, right? For famous family. Well, he had a really important 90210 episode. That's true. He was <laughs> That's true. Somebody's evil boy, ex-boyfriend, Brandon, had to punch him out. Oh, no. Yeah. We'll come back to 90210 yeah. because, of course... Yes. The great. Oh my Sean God. Hardell's in your this favorite. Movie. One of your true loves. <laughs> yeah. That's at what's age the best. Cress Williams. Julia loved <laughs> Sean Hardell. Absolutely loved. Uh, another contender the weird party event at the bar that all ages and everyone in the movie just seems to be at for some reason. Yeah. Her students, assistant, teachers. Her, yeah. It, plus her assistant's there. And he's like, yeah. I know her. Oh, yeah. Just doesn't make any sense. Like, why Why are they all there? And then the dance scene just goes on for so long. And she does kind of like a sexual move in the dance scene with the boa constrictor, which I was just like, I thought the point is she doesn't have any sexual knowledge or experience. How would she know to do that? Right. That didn't make any sense. It's always tough when somebody's never done anything before. And then at the end, they just, they kiss somebody perfectly on the pitcher's mound in front of a thousand people. It's like, I thought you didn't never kiss anybody. It, right. Exactly. Just instinctively know how to do it. Okay. Yeah. And then this might actually be rewatchable and fun, but I think this is the time to talk about Gary Marshall and his first scene when he excoriates the staff for getting scooped by the Trib um, on an investigative report. It's dialed up. <laughs> Gary dialed it up. Why is Gary Marshall in this movie? Somebody called it sick. Someone was just like, we need Gary Marshall to save the movie. We need a a luminary of the rom-com space. Really successful at this point in his life, too. Oh, yes. Not somebody that just needed to waltz into a terrible Drew Barrymore movie. Although Roger Ebert did give it three stars, so maybe it wasn't terrible. That has has to have something to do with like the Chicago newspaper of it all. Because Ebert was from Chicago, right? Yeah. Yeah. You were from the same time where she Uh works. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah, so and, and that was like part of his review right. where he was like, ha ha, the shorts of the Chicago Sun Times. Uh, we also got the prom scene, which inexplicably in- includes a disgusting dog food gag. Mm-hmm. Which uh, Listen, the prom scene is the most rewatchable scene. Yeah. That's actually a pretty <laughs> enjoyable seven minutes. And it made me realize I'm in on all prom scenes. I don't think there's ever been a prom scene where I've said to myself, ah, I could skip this one. Yeah. It just brings all kinds of dynamics into it or a high school dance, all that stuff. Like, that, it always works. I agree with this. Can't but her, work. Her, People are dressed up. Something bad's going to happen. Just, it's a win every time. But her speech is so bad. It's among the worst rom-com slash teen movie declaration speeches of all time. Let me tell you something. I don't care about being your stupid prom queen. I'm 25 years old. I'm an undercover reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times, and I have been beating my brains out trying to impress you people. Let me tell you something, Gibby, Kirsten, Kristen. You will spend your lives trying to figure out how to keep others down because it makes you feel more important. I thought about typing it out so I could read it to you guys, and then I thought, what am I doing with my life? No. Luminary doesn't deserve this. not good. (laughs) They don't deserve me <laughs> typing out a whole speech from Just a terrible movie. Just to bolster movie. the Mean Girls stole from Never Been Kissed uh, theory, the end speech in Mean Girls is also terrible because she didn't have any good source material to work from. That's a good point. And yeah. also in this movie, the prom scene includes- I like this theory. Yeah. It's growing on me. The plastic tiara and being like, what does this mean? Right. That That is yes, very similar. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it is very similar. So you, you go prom scene over final scene on the baseball diamond? 
That's that would be one A one B. The last twenty minutes of this movie are actually pretty weirdly watchable. Yeah, they're from a different movie. It's, John yeah. C. Riley returns to Earth and is no longer shouting all the time, so it becomes like slightly more enjoyable. Let's let's hold that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So prom scene. That's the most rewatchable scene. I I mean I have to go with the baseball diamond. It's from a different movie, but it is definitely the one that's lodged. It in It feels brain. like they did film it yeah. three uh, three months after filming ended, where they had to reshoot the ending. <laughs> Thank you. Um, may I have five minutes on the clock, please? But it also. Why does everybody like her? Nothing makes sense. I have it no idea. Inexplicable. Also, also, why did he go? It's like she made him look so bad. I'm right. Like, it's inexplicable. Yeah, he's like, can you get arrested? Yeah. He should be like going to Mexico. Also, basically, the fact that she's never kissed anyone is introduced in the beginning of the movie, then totally forgotten for the entire part. of Like, it's not mentioned again in the entire movie until she writes the piece and he has to do it at the end. But it's just like they, it's like they wrote the title. Yeah. And then they thought of the last scene and then they just wrote a movie that to go along with it. I don't understand what flipped where she became this heinous person who lied to all these people at the prom and stole the prom queen title to let's all go to the baseball game and give her a standing ovation. That it, she landed it's, the it's teacher. It's the power of a personal essay, Bill. Exactly. I want, so, I want to, should we just go into yes. what's age of the best? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> personal essays? Well, I did have on the list that her first big writing assignment turned into a personal essay. Oh. Many mm-hmm. people would approach that in the same way on the internet. Presaging yeah. the internet, basically. It yes. Yeah. It's okay. sort of, that's like the cover of New York Magazine this week is Tavi Gevinson on, with a personal essay about, yeah. about her past. Like, that's just sort of a thing that people do. I, I don't know. I think it's a great point. Yeah. Very fair point. Uh, the ensemble cast. It's astonishing. Let's just go over the names. It's an ab- absolutely stunningly loaded cast. It is it is truly stunning. Molly Shannon, who was like probably at the peak of Molly Shannon's career, 1999, maybe just crested. She's doing SNL too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Apex Mountain for her. John C. Riley. Yeah. Well, let's save him. Octavia Spencer. Just in like two scenes. <laughs> just thrown away. Just yeah. for, so what was she like in a like a secretary? She also like works with them, but uh, oh, yeah, we yeah, don't yeah. know what her job is. <laughs> she has no character development. No, Unclear. not at all. She just like shows up for a few scenes. Not even uh, Gary Marshall, as mentioned, Lily Sobieski, who then goes on to be like a teen star of, of the time. That was. Oh, we'll get to her too. Jessica Alba, early Alba, very early. Yeah. Uh, Deshaun Hardell, a.k.a. Cress Williams, really only meaningful to a small body of people, but two of them are in this room. Is he top five all time for you? Yes, because, you know, he also had a great arc on ER. I Just, know. Yeah. He did 902 and ER yeah. in this movie and one other thing, right? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but 902 and ER is enough. My dream 902 and plot of all time, dating mm-hmm. back 25 years, was him taking Donna's virginity. Oh, oh. I think that could have been a whole season of everybody reacting to that. Would have been <laughs> out of control, including her mom. And they, I can't believe they didn't do it. It was ten, a 10 episode arc. Yeah, that would have she been just, amazing. She just went with it one night and then her mom found out. It just would have been unbelievable. If Aaron Spelling's not driving that show, that happens. Oh. If it's anyone but his daughter. Um, she he dances with her in the in the epic. Dylan comes back to yeah. ruin the whatever thing, and it's it and the look on her mom's face. Yes, yeah, she's like upset. Oh, she's more than upset. She's she's reacting like <laughs> something truly horrible is happening, and it's like, how do you not tap into this? This is a, hu- uh, a huge mess. Ugh. Uh, we also got James Franco. With, yeah, with a small cameo. Really that was early. One where Franco. I had to rewind and be like, wait, is that James Franco? I mean, it was James it was Franco. James Franco. I thought I saw Robert Pattinson, but I it, I don't think it was him. But there's no a, way Robert Pattinson. No, He's was too young. Yeah, yeah. But there's yeah. a Robert Pattinson dead ringer. Um, and then of course Michael Vartan. I yeah. mean, it's like just insane. Like that is now would be an incredible cast. You'd be like, how did they get all these people? And somehow they they did it in 1999. The power of Drew Barrymore, I guess. <laughs> did you say Gary Marshall? I yeah. did. Yeah. I felt like there was one more one that I was shocked was in the movie. Oh, Jordan Ladd's in it. Oh, Jordan Ladd. She had a cut. She was in, she led a horror movie. Cheryl's daughter. 
She was in some terrible horror mm. movie that I've probably seen three times. <laughs> okay. So I watch all horror movies. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No problem. Um, some other nominees. Uh, Lily Sobieski's headbands, which are back in style right now. They are. Though she wears them really weirdly, like with like the front in front of her ears instead of behind because she's like a weird kid. But whatever. Yeah. I was going to say in general, the clothes are back in style. They're all and back. it's just because like the late 90s are now what's what's cool fashion wise. Yeah. And then I thought the way that they were wa- that she's like kind of broadcasting what's happening through her body cam actually aged well to me. Something that I think they would still do reminded me of like watching an Instagram live story mm-hmm. essentially. And I, I thought that I thought that played well, actually. I didn't think that was that weird. Plus the Truman Show had done it. So it just it made sense. So that's how what's aged the best weirdly was there was this run of Truman Show, Ed TV, this movie of people realizing that other people experiencing somebody's life in the moment in real time. It was like basically the real world starts in like 92. Yeah. Right. By the end of that decade, it's like, oh, I like being the voyeur for somebody else's life. People start making movies. And this was a gimmick that was there for a while. Yeah. And it, it works. It does. The Truman Show has aged. We've kind really of gone well. away from that gimmick a little bit. Well, I think now it's just how everyone lives life. Right. So it's not a gimmick. It's just it's kind a of gimmick. a storytelling mechanism. It's basically vlogging. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Um, a couple other nominees. These come from Amanda. The prom theme. Normally, it's a really dumb prom theme. I honestly think famous couples across time, as far as a group of teenagers getting together to come up with a prom theme, pretty good. It works. It works. How did you feel about David Arquette playing Tom Cruise from Cocktail? Did you feel like that was I mean, an insult? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Didn't love it. Uh, I have a what stage the best. Okay. okay. Um, I just think Drew Barrymore at this stage of her career, I really enjoyed just her where she could be in a movie like this and she could be not attractive one scene, attractive the next scene. It felt like anybody in the movie she was attainable for. She wasn't like, she was just relatable. And I remember seeing her in movies like this and feeling like, Drew Barrymore was at a bar. I feel like I could like talk to her for 20 minutes and maybe have a chance. Yeah. Which I don't like Julie Roberts. You didn't think that. No. You weren't going to sleep with the enemy going, I bet if Julie Roberts was in the room, I bet I could at least like yeah. get a vibe going. She'd be cool. And I, she would want Drew to Drew Barrymore was like, like very like all inclusive. She, she just kind of. Ex- She's down to earth. Like she's she, like a it could sunshine be, and it could and be any dogs. actor. It could be Adam Sandler, you know, and wedding singer. Like, it was realistic that she liked Adam Sandler's character mm-hmm. because the persona she always gave was like, I like anybody who's a nice person. I don't know. I don't know who's like that now, I guess would be my point. Who's super famous? Just who is a famous actress who's good looking, but who gives off that vibe like of right anyone person. has a chance with me? Well, I think with Drew Barrymore, she craved it. Like, I think she, like, she, first of all, she dated a, she married a normie, that guy, Will, who she then broke up with. She married Tom Green. I forgot like, about that. I totally forgot about that. He's a fucking lunatic. <laughs> yeah. She At, around this the- time, too. Like, right shortly thereafter this movie. My favorite Drew Barrymore moment was when she was dating one of the Strokes. She was dating the drummer. Oh, yeah. For Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. And she got really cool, like, for the two years. I loved it. Well, right. When she's doing press for this movie, she goes on Letterman. And she tells him, like, I've just been hanging out by myself, and it's great. It's amazing. Like, she's, like, talks about how she goes to Hawaii by herself. I think, she, I mean, she was just a lot. But that was soul. another, that, Letterman's another one. Mm-hmm. She tapped into this Letterman side that we'd never considered him, like, in a sexual way. And she yes. really flirted yes. with him in a crazy way. And then it turns out Letterman behind the scenes is a little more sexual than maybe <laughs> we gave him credit for. Oh, boy. But she was the only one who was like, yeah, this guy, there's yeah. something there. She's just such a total— and she did with Larry Sanders, too. She had a big Larry Sanders episode, late 90s, too. She's just a total, like, product of the system, of the Hollywood system, in, in a way that I think we don't really see anymore. Like, when's the last time we had a 13-year-old in rehab? Mm-hmm. I wish—I think she could have been—I think she had a great movie career, made a lot of money, but I think she could have had an awesome sh- TV show. Yes. Yeah. I think she's definitely one of those people you would have, like, 8.30 Thursday nights— Drew Barrymore as blank. Yes. I think she could have just crushed it. I mean, she's a really good actress with range. Like she, she actually can play a few different types of characters. I wouldn't say in this movie, maybe no. not. No, not the best case. But like Adam Sandler gets good performances out of her. Yes, she's good in Fifty First Dates. That yeah, movie's good. Yeah. My kids love that movie. Yeah, I, as you guys know, I love music and lyrics with Hugh Grant. Yeah, great one. Uh, all right, so what age? What age the best? 
you got to give it to the cast, I think. Amanda? I really like the personal essay insight from okay. you. I think that's, it's, it definitely is about ahead of its time. So it's definitely true. Yeah. Bill? Person, the personal essay. Okay, great. The I mean, era, we're Juliet. The era of the personal yeah, essay. Yeah. yeah. Let's go to what's age the worst. I can't wait. <laughs> Straight to what is the worst. Bill, kick it off. What do you have? John C. Riley's so bad in this movie. <laughs> I don't understand I what he's doing. Starting. I know. I just, I think he's a great actor. This isn't that far away from Boogie Nights when he's unbelievable in it. And he's acting in this movie like he's trying to sabotage it, which makes me think that maybe he was. It seems That's possible. how terrible he is. I mean, what does he have to work with, really? Which is like a... Really- I need to know what... Like, like, what made him think that was a good volume for his voice for an hour and a half? I, you know, it's unbelievable. He's so bad. I don't know. I would not say that John C. Riley and Drew Barrymore have the same energy. You know, it's and I would I would love to talk to the casting director who clearly worked very hard and went for a lot of names. This is a good get, John C. Riley in nineteen ninety nine. But if you're matching it with like Drew Barrymore's completely loosey goosey sunny mentality, there's there's just something about that they're supposed to be friends and on the same team. I don't know. I think that John C. Riley and Molly Shannon were in a different movie than, yeah. than Drew Barrymore. Amanda. Yes. He made Magnolia the same year. <laughs> He's a good actor. Just the <laughs> performance does not make sense. I'm just I saying. wish I had asked him about it when I did the podcast. But hey, man, I just got to ask you. Just, like, what happened with Never Back Kiss? He's trying to get some money and is just like, what is this direct that I'm being asked to do? Something- Another What's Age the Worst? Um, a teacher falling in love with his yeah, student. I have the basic romantic <laughs> premise. Is that is that is that a problem? Mary Mary Jo Laterno was always a, a big figure for me growing up. Always like knew who she was. So maybe the writers of this did as well. Mm. They're like they're I mean, aware of that story. Let's Although be she real. did this she did go ha- to jail. This happens. No, I know. Right? Yes, regularly. I just can't believe they made a movie. About I know, it. and I can't believe they also made it. Or okay they in end the up movie together. That you're rooting for it. Yeah. that's the crazy thing. It's like, oh, they made like, it. That is an adult, and she is supposed to be a student. I guess maybe they think because we, the audience, know that she is actually of legal age of consent I are in real life that it's okay it's not okay no it's definitely not I or mean, it's like the case the case for him is deep down he knew she was older than 18 can I just tell you that's, literally that's the, the only case the first thing he says to her like in English class and she is like declining some Latin verbs or whatever and he goes are you sure you're 17 yeah which what is that who is who is saying that in a school setting or really any setting. Completely inappropriate. If you got to ask, it's Completely a no. inappropriate. Tough one. But not only is the premise bad, but then there's like a crucial scene where Drew Barrymore and David Arquette are talking to each other and they're joking about who's committing worse statutory rape at the party in the, yeah. in the kitchen. Yeah. I think that is the most appalling scene. I think that is worse than the whole setup. It's I'm I'm personally I'm not like violated by it. It's so staggeringly bad <laughs> that I kind of enjoy it. It's a it's a one up but ship statutory rape conversation in a rom com. It's shocking, shocking. Like if that happened in a movie now, you would be like, like it's what? Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, would, it just wouldn't. It's it's like, just, I'm coming around happen. on this movie. It's so amazing. <laughs> it's like, How did this happen? You're back in. Um. The total humiliation of Josie and some awkward teens. I mean, it, like you said, bullying has become a thing that we care about. And maybe this movie invented bullying. It didn't invent it, but it, it made it clear what yeah. it looked like. But it didn't really bullying? like. There's yeah. been movies with bullying but other than this movie. Oh, yeah. But I, I just think that the way that it's like a crass plot device that yeah. is upended by the throwing of a can of dog food. <laughs> it's just I always thought bizarre. that was like a carry homage. It was. It was Carrie. because at the end, David Arquette says, I thought she was going to go full carry on yeah. us. Yeah. And then none of the teens know what that is. Do you think <laughs> that's true? Because it would have been like 20 <laughs> yeah. plus years. Do you think he shouldn't have been outed? And then the last scene should have been him winning the baseball game as 32-year-old <laughs> starter? <laughs> Nothing makes sense to that character. Okay. Like, that's I literally have, nothing. I have a whole what was he doing about, all day for a job? I don't know. All right, and, keep going. We'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to picking nits. Uh, other things that have aged poorly, they make fun of cheap wine coolers. 
cheap wine coolers really in right now. They're back. They're so back. We never tried our White Claw. I've had White Claw, Amanda. Oh, okay. You've this never tried it. This is a huge summer for White Claw. I yes. know, but I had never heard of it. And so then the Tea Time Girls got me a White Claw. I nominated it. So I could, quote, it. engage with the culture. I can't believe White Claw hasn't done like a major deal with our podcast I know, network. I know. Seems because like there's a lot of White Claw going around. We named it as a potential MVP of the summer on the Ringer Dish End of Summer Awards. And that's where this came from. Yeah. Um. So that, that was, I think, very precious. Uh, and then these actors, what would you say the median age is based on just a, a visual assessment? You mean for people in high school, playing high school people? Just if, you, if, you, if, you, if you had a lineup of all of these actors from this movie at the time, what would you guess their age As is? they're portrayed in the movie, yeah. Uh, portrayed in the movie or actual ages? Like, what do you think their actual age is? Like, uh, like 29, yeah, 32? It's, it's yeah. like everyone looks like a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, really old. <laughs> this was the last kind of the 90s were the last time that really happened. Yeah. I mean, 90210 famously did it, but where it's just like, ah, it's fine. It's so ridiculous that I wonder if it's intentional and they're trying to skirt past all the age issues by being like, none of this is real, where it's everyone's a grown up and, you know, this is a, this is a, Made up movie, but it doesn't work. I, we, there's not a lot written about like behind the scenes of this movie. Like, like I was looking, and there's not a ton. But I, I can't th- believe it. I, well, I have to assume stuff went really badly, and that's how we end up with this movie. It couldn't have been like this is the plan the whole time. Well, one of the weird things is Lily Sobieski is like 15 when she made this movie because this same year she played a 15 year old in Eyes Wide Shut. Oh yeah. So it's her and a bunch of like 28 year olds on the set. Mm-hmm. Which is weird. Really, weird really casting. Weird. Why do you have her, but then all old people? Yeah, it, it didn't make sense. I think Drew Barrymore was just like, I'm in this movie. So then they had to cast it around her, but they made her best friend 10 years younger than her. Or they cast someone 10, right. 10 years younger, which really didn't help. Um, what else aged really poorly? What did I miss? Well, there's also a thing where when John C. Riley is like, nail him, you know, you got to get the report. You're supposed to think that he's a bad person for wanting her it's to do true. basic journalism. Which, you know, I think we have a different response <laughs> to these types of investigative reports now in 2019. There's a really interesting history of investigative journalism in high school movies over the years. Because just one of the guys, the mm-hmm. an all-time classic from the mid-80s. The whole premise of that movie is her editor at her school paper doesn't think she should be a writer mm-hmm. for the school paper because she's a woman. Which is insane now, but that's... The premise, so she actually goes to a different high school pretending to be a guy so then she can prove to him that she can actually be on the school paper. But that it's the same kind of thing with, they just would use these school newspapers as like, let's put the worst possible person in charge. <laughs> like in real life, the school newspaper person is usually like a nice person. Yeah. Who's like, hey, I just want to help some kids. It's true. It's not, it's not somebody who's like a dictator. <laughs> or like the worst misogynist of all time. It's kind of like all these movie archetypes were picked up for this for the screen this um script and then just like thrown into a fun house and just came out really weird and nothing matched. They do steal from like 12 movies yes. in so, this movie. So including so many. just one of the guys. Right. So many. Amanda, what do you what's And your Can't verdict? Buy Me Love's another one where they steal from. For what part? Bunch of the bunch oh. of the movie. The whole I mean Can't Buy Me Love created the I hang out with the nerds, but now sure. I'm making a run to be popular. It was the, it's the template. Right. You can you can tie 40 movies to Can't Buy Me Love. We should do that as a rewatchable. It's great. Point. I want that. White it's suit. still I really it good. Really the white time. suede suit with the mm. oh, it's so good. I watched it with my kids three weeks ago. Oh. It absolutely held. They were riveted. My son was like, "That was great." Then I was like, it. "Yeah, Amanda Peterson's dead. She drug <laughs> problem for twenty okay. years. Showed her right. a mugshot, <laughs> and they were like, "No, can't we have any good things?" <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, what are you going with? What age the worst? Oh, I mean the plot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the plot is reprehensible. Yep. I think uh, we can move on. Agree. <laughs> John C. Riley, though, don't count him out as a uh, candidate. We'll come back to him. Uh, the 1990, 1999 award for the most 1999 moment or thing. I think there's quite a few. Yeah. Um, my personal favorite is the song Closer to Myself by Kendall Payne, which was used uh, when she's having like a transformative moment, Big Dawson's Creek and WB songs. So I just really, that meant a lot to me. But first of all, people reading newspapers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shout out, good air for yeah. that. Shout out Roger Ebert. Um, Josie's Ice Blue Lipstick. 
Right, on the first day. Yeah. I definitely owned that. That's I did why too. I put that in. I was like, oh, we I can never remember, should have done that. I can remember wearing that to like a school dance in like sixth or seventh was grade. Was it like from Delia's? It was something like that. It was like the white and clear like lipstick yeah. container. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the name of that brand? Wet and Wild? I think that's right. Okay. I, I can't remember. <laughs> Tough uh, look for all of us. The high school heartthrob looking like a rejected member of Oasis? I really, he has a very late 90s or mid to late 90s vibe. It's more mid and then it's, he's lo- a loser. So he's in a 1999 movie. I was positive that guy was in like a lot of movies. His name is Danny Kirkwood as like the heartthrob in a teen movie or a rom-com, but he's actually not. I just think that this was such like an iconic look for guys at the time mm-hmm. that I was positive I had seen him before. Yeah. I, really I think it. the soundtrack feels 1999-ish because- it's nostalgic for songs from the previous generation in the right ways. Like it has, I was just looking, it has a, a really good Smith song. Please, please, please let me get what mm-hmm. I want, which is like the right time to kind of go backwards with a song like that. And it also uses uh, Watching the Wheels by John Lennon, which I thought was good. It uses an R.E.M. song. The Cardigans are in there. It just feels, Jimmy, Jimmy World is in there, Semisonic. It does feel very late 90s-ish. And the, and the music's pretty good in this movie. Yeah, I say, it might be one of the best aspects of the movie. Yeah. It's the soundtrack. It's like, solid. They, and good. songs used in the right spots and the right ways. Mm-hmm. They, the, the Smith song is used really well. I didn't, I'm going to be honest, didn't register for me. I'm sorry, I'm too young. I'm a big Smith guy. <laughs> no. I like this. When is it in the movie? I like the Smiths. I just don't remember this. It's during a sad part. Well, which one? The whole movie is sad. Well, no, there's one sad part where things aren't going to work out. <laughs> right. I thought that was the John I can't Lennon remember song. which part. When, okay. No, it, it, there's two different parts. Okay. I believe you. I believe yeah. you, too. Um, the marching band played the Simpsons theme song. I love to disconnect the battery, too. I caught that. Yeah. And I don't really, I'm not a huge Simpsons person, so I was just proud of myself and wanted to put it's that It's pretty funny. There. It is pretty 90s. Yeah. There's also a point when uh, Michael Varden is trying to explain who, is it Gordy Howe? Is that the hockey player? Yeah. Okay, you're just playing. <laughs> oh, it's a good sad song. Yeah, remember? I know this song. I just don't remember in this well, movie. Well, Julia needed to hear it. I did. I, I'm, I'm not good with like cool music from the 80s yeah. and 90s. So it's a hole in a resume. Yeah, sorry. Unless it was in a rom Or on the WB. Or in WB. <laughs> um, I think just in general, the fashion is super 90s, yeah. and that's why it's also aged well, is because all those fashions are back. And so, like, I would go fashion or or Jessica Alba, like being super young and having her whole career ahead of her when you would think, like, oh, she's going to be a major star. And then it didn't happen. Also, just having, I guess she became super successful. Having Lily Sobieski in this movie is very 1999 to me. Totally. (laughs) I was just like, oh, you. Okay. I know what year it is. Completely. What was that movie she made with Josh Hartnett where one of them was dying? Oh, my God. Oh, God. That's like, if we do Rewatchables 2000, we might have to do that one. Here on Earth. Here on Earth. Somebody oh, died yeah, in that, yeah, or yeah, somebody yeah, was yeah, dying yeah. in that movie. He's like maybe like with James Vanderbeek, the most 1999 actor. Oh, Him, yeah. Fr- Halloween H20. Yeah. And Freddie Prince Jr. I would say those three are like the year 1999. FPJ? FPJ. Mm-hmm. I love FPJ. You wouldn't put Sarah Michelle Gellar in there? I'm just saying men. Okay. Fine. Can I just a well, quick FPJ thing? A friend of mine recently got me some cameo videos, including one from FPJ, <gasps> and it was Awesome. It was, it was a, like, he got me a lot of cameos. Thank you, Mike. And it was like really sincere and sweet. It was awesome. Great career. That's lovely. I Love still support FPJ. that guy. Was in a lot of good movies. <laughs> he really is. All right. We're going fashion Lily Sobieski, I think, on this one. Okay. Next. Casting what ifs. Not a lot of these. Because no one wanted to be in this no movie. No one wanted to be in this movie. So, <laughs> but this or is, everyone said yes right away. They're like, Drew, I'm in. <laughs> Chloe Sevigny considered for, the, for Lily Sobieski's role. Oh, wow. Would have been a really different movie, and also she would have been like a little more. That would have been NC seventeen. Yeah. That's why something would have happened. She would have participated in the statutory rape conversation for sure. <laughs> oh, totally, <laughs> she would have been there. Uh, next, the Dion Waiters Award for yeah. the best heat check performance. Oh wow! I mean, Lily. It, it's just Lily. Right? Lily's good in this movie, and yeah. I still I have some Lily stock from twenty years ago. Okay. What's up with Lily these days? Lily, the glass house kind of set her back. Uh, she's got a great speaking voice. I wish, I, let's get her a podcast because it's just a nice speaking voice. Nice timbre to it. Can we put John C. Riley in this category? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as bad as Bill is, but I think it's Lily Sobieski. Okay, we'll come back to him for I, a different I think one. it's the worst performance by a really good actor, potentially, of, of this whole entire year. 
1999. If we went through all the movies that were made in 1999, I think this would win the 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 Razzie for okay. worst performance. I just don't feel like it's significant enough. To oh, win it's the so Razzie. bad. You're wrong. I this think is, the, yell- is a bad the yelling is significant. It's, He's so it's, bad. Is that great? But I'm just kind of like, what the, what the fuck is happening in this movie? He's just, I, I'm angry about other things. I think he was trying to get fired. The weirdest scene is the one with him and Molly Shannon. And like the first, the first like 45 minutes of the movie, there's like a connection there. And then they never come back to it. It's so fucking weird. All right. Half-assed internet research. Yeah. Mostly done by uh, producer Craig. Thank you, Craig. Craig. David Arquette's character is named Rob, Rob Geller. And at the time he was dating, he was married to Courtney Cox, who was playing Monica Geller. One of the most inexplicable relationships we've had. <laughs> Gotta be. I drugs, would watch a right? documentary on that one. <laughs> Probably. Uh, no, I mean, I think everyone's having fun. No, I think some some women like having the guy that like they have to save, right? Mm-hmm. It's a little many savior women. complex. Yeah, yeah many people women. like a project. I, you know, I think Jennifer Garner and Ben Affleck. Sure. Look when she falls in love with them. He's got and, forty things going and on. And sometimes people underestimate the intensity of the project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no question. Uh, this film was mostly shot in two neighborhoods in the Los Angeles area. One was Hancock Park, where they had many exteriors, including... Uh, it's John- a great place. Yeah, it's lovely, very picturesque. Uh, the other is Monrovia, where a lot of the... like Monrovia. The, yes, yeah. it's where the uh, like cafe is and, and all that. Um, Never Been's Kiss was James Franco's first movie appearance. Wow. We were there, for, we were there at the beginning, guys. Felt great. Um... As we've pointed out, the movie has many similarities to Mean Girls that uh, many people on the internet have noted. Similarities. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> Maybe we write a piece for this on The Ringer. I don't think the Deverman Kiss is important enough. We're doing it now. Did Tina Fey rip off oh, boy. Never Been Kissed? I don't know. I think that gets traffic. <laughs> Who can say? Okay. Was Tina Fey a thief? <laughs> Who? We can't say no. Uh, Listen, it, there is like seven similarities. Yeah, there's a I lot. Know. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the, speech the whole at the structure prom. of the movie is yeah. similar. Yeah, the speech at the prom, the structure of the movie, Chicago, math, com- mathletes, commentary on um, cool versus uncool, the, the prom prom queen thing, the crossing paths in the, the mall. mall. That's a very specific. Yeah, one. go. I mean, going undercover and then having the the Janice Lee character confront you is the a, three girls yeah who are the cool girl, the mm-hmm. cool three yeah and then she talks about every high school has somebody like this yeah yeah there's a lot there Apex Mountain is this anyone's Apex Mountain yes who Molly Shannon okay what? because she's on at, at height oh, of her okay. SNL right. plus this movie we should have mentioned her sex ed scene as the most as, as a rewatchable she's actually scene. good in this movie she is good she's yeah. a good actress she is good in this movie um sex <laughs> is really fun when you're old enough which none of you are trust me I should know because when you lose it to some guy named Junior with bad breath in the back of a van at a Guns N' Roses concert you're going to wish you listened to your mother when she said, you know, nobody's going to want to buy the whole friggin' ice cream truck when you're handing out the popsicles for free. <laughs> um, she's in her own movie, but she's good. And I think Lily Sobieski, because she has this and eyes wide shut, and you would have said like, oh, that, that person's going somewhere. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Joey Pants Award. Gary Marshall. Because I didn't know who it was, and I knew I knew him, and I actually had to go on Google to. I was like, I know who that is. I and think I if could you're remember. if you're in a League of Their Own fan, you know Gary Marshall, though. I had to look it up, and I know everything. I, want, I know every single thing, and I had to look it up. You don't. You do know everything about movies. That's true. No, Gary, I. I just. I think he's a good one. Yeah. So I. Unfortunately, the real answer is Deshaun Hardell, but I don't want to hurt your feelings. That's what I was going to say. For me, it's I don't definitely hurt your Chris feelings. Williams. <laughs> it's 100,000 rec- said him. I recognize it's him. I, I didn't, but let's say it's Gary Marshall because I want you to be in a good place. The assistant is a good runner-up. Sean Whalen. Yeah. Yeah. He's in so much shit. You're He's, just like, yeah. you're just like, who is that guy? He's mine, Deshaun Whalen, who plays okay. her assistant. I'm like, I, I didn't know even know face. what Deshaun Hardell's name was until you kept saying it earlier in the podcast. <laughs> I just assumed he was legally had changed his name to Deshaun, Deshaun Hardell. Hardell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Sean Hardell is one of my all-time TV crushes. All time. I love that guy. We know. <laughs> <laughs> Saul Rubinek Award for overreacting. Oh, man. Done. Next one. <laughs> Picking nits. Amanda, wow. I cede the floor to you. Wow. Okay. Well, you added this one, which is why is Molly Shannon's character over-sexualized? Yes. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess so she can give the sex ed speech. 
Which is a little which funny. Which is kind of worth it. Yeah, but it's it's kind of unnecessary. I guess also maybe she's trying to, they're like trying to create a comparison between her and Drew Barrymore, who's never been kissed, but then they never revisit the plot of her ever being kissed until the end. So it's not valid. It's really weird. Okay. Um, Julia and I both put this down. The makeover happens like instantly. She shows up the first day wearing the feathers and the ice blue and looks terrible. And then the next day she has perfect hair and is wearing very cool clothes straight from the Delia's catalog and looks amazing. This is not feasible. Did she do this all by herself? I have no idea. I don't know. And here's the biggest miss. And it makes you wonder if anybody knew what they were doing in this movie. What's better than a makeover scene? It always works. It's so true. Just have somebody be like, hey, Drew, let's go shopping. Oh, here comes a hot song from 1999 and right. Drew's going to put on outfits. It's an Come iconic on. part of Clueless. Like, it's like one of the best parts of Clueless. How Come did on. I miss it? No brainer. It's, I have no idea. It's really weird. I have a nitpick. How did, it's really abrupt where all of a sudden she's friends with the three. Mm-hmm. Everything like, in this movie's abrupt. <laughs> they, they have kind of a moment in class and next scene, they're just, they're rolling. Yeah. This was a, a girl who had loser on her head like 10 minutes earlier. Right. And is now with the, with the queen bees. Didn't understand that. Didn't make any sense. Um, I didn't like how she was constantly correcting people's grammar. Yeah. I, co- copy editors, not only do I not like it, I know several copy editors, they don't do that. Copy editors are wonderful. They help. And they okay. should be respected. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> copy editors help. They don't overcorrect you in person. Yeah, that's true. They don't typically have assistants, but that's... No. Yeah. Anyway. That, that's, that's a good That's a good nit to pick. Yeah. Um, carry on. Okay. I just, every single part of Josie going undercover to me I, does not add up. First of all, she uses her own name at the school. I, I, I mean. And how is it this easy to just reapply to a high school? This is what I'm saying. David like, Arquette's just in high school, school again. registration work that everyone's just wandering in is like, yes, I'd like to go to high school. Could I do like, this? cool. Don't you need like old transcripts? Isn't there some sort of, I know it's like. 1999, but it's not like medieval times. There is like basic paperwork that you have yeah. to have to go to school. It's a whole. Don't they have to know whether you had your vaccines or whatever? I guess that maybe not anymore. <laughs> Skipping past that. Also, she's just walking around using a tape recorder yeah. like in the hallway and no one's up on it. It's I weird. Okay. Um, How about I have issues with her winning the prom queen? Absolutely. Completely 100 to 1 odds heading into that prom. It's definitely one of the other three. She just became cool like a week ago. Yeah, that's true. Though teenagers are really fickle. Eh, even so, it was, a, it was a total reach. Yeah, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't get it. Also, no homework or parents to be seen for anyone. No, nobody has parents in this movie. Like none, just absolutely none. Okay, here's one for you. There's no school. There's no party at somebody's house either. This entire movie, right? Well, isn't that where the That's inappropriate where this- statutory rape conversations yeah. happen? That was at somebody's house. That was okay. in the kitchen. Yeah. Right. Okay. If David Arquette's age is exposed along with Josie's, Drew Barrymore's, then should the baseball team still be allowed to be in the national championships or the state championships? Oh, no, you're right. They, right. they would get— They'd be out. They'd have right. to forfeit the game. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then the last scene doesn't work, but whatever. And yeah, then, it's finally, an empty baseball speaking diamond. of the last scene, does he actually read the newspaper piece and show up? Because they're showing him packing and he gets called to the door right as he's grabbing the page with the personal essay. It was called to the door by the police. We had some <laughs> questions for him. <laughs> I just need to know more about how he goes from packing up and hating her to actually showing up to the baseball diamond. Can we talk about how bad the last part of her personal essay was? I, I That's a major nitpick. Go ahead. It's going fine. And then at the end, she's like, I hope to find love, blah, blah, blah. Sincerely, Carly, or whatever her name is. Like, <laughs> Jos- it's just, she's Josie Grossi. It's just like, what, is this a letter or is it an essay? What is this? Are you writing a letter to the penthouse forum? I agree with this. It was just bad. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, know. this movie is actively bad. Yes, it's actively bad. It's aggressively, I, incoherently bad. I just want to say, I do think Michael Vartan's character reads the newspaper just because he's supposed to be like, Fake guy, reads a lot, <laughs> loves Shakespeare, loves literature, keeps up with the news. I have a small nitpick, and it's going it to potentially be perceived as creepy, but I just want to point it out. I can't wait. She's dancing with, with the guy at the prom. Mm-hmm. And Vartan's kind of staring her down mm-hmm. with that little bit jealous look. Yeah. I just don't think a teacher, I don't care how, how statutory rapey you're going to get, 
is going to be that obvious. Like, all right, I'm just going to stand on a stage and just stare at one of one of my students. I <laughs> like. I agree with this. Wouldn't other people be like, what the fuck is that dude staring at? Why is he staring down? He's a creepy teacher. He would have been fired. He's super creepy. He would have been fired. He shouldn't right? work again. Yeah, he's out. He, he might also be, be like a can't come 100 yards within a school. Like, I just think right. there's a lot yes. of ramifications. Yes. yes. Not, not. A thousand people cheering him in a baseball game because right. he's making out what with somebody. Also, if we're talking about people who can't go within a thousand feet of a school, like probably Drew Barrymore and David Arquette. Yeah. After right. They have gone David Arquette, undercover David without Arquette's permission. Out. And they're both statutory. <laughs> I'm just saying, instead, they're all allowed to be on the baseball diamond, make it out. Would you have thrown in a scene where he's being escorted away in handcuffs, David <laughs> Arquette? <laughs> just, just subtly, you just see him in the background, just... The main scene I would have wanted to see is uh, Michael Vartan breaking up with his girlfriend. Like, why do they yeah, break God up? God forbid we yeah. saw that. What did that look like? Is it because he's in love with a seventeen-year-old? Like, they do not what's do, going on they there. They don't develop the connection between them at all, no. except for like dumb Shakespeare recitations in English class. Which I have like- a really tough nitpick. Okay, this is a newspaper in the late nineties. Not exactly like Money Pockets. Mm-hmm. They have the ability to put on like a James Bond camera. Oh, yeah, like live streaming. On her, streaming. On her breast. That's a great point. That can somehow capture her surroundings right. perfectly with no hiccups right. in the video system. And then also, they're all watching it yeah, in the office. Yeah, I was going to say, no one has to be doing any other work at the newspaper. So they can all just sit no in the office. No glitches. Thing never falls. Yeah. It's, she's talking to Michael Vartan, who's like right where Juliet's knee is, but somehow it gets a whole picture of everything. Like, what kind of camera is this? Yeah, that's a good point. The technology Thanks. is not. Is not we did not have this technology in 1999. I'm just telling you. <laughs> we d- we couldn't even text in 1999, much less <laughs> videotape people discreetly. Live stream it. Yeah, yeah. That's true. How do they even think of that? Even the video cameras back then were still a little bulky. Yeah. I know. They were less bulky than they were in the 80s. But Weird. And like, who even thought of that? All right. Also, they had no other stories to work on that 20 right. of them could just gather and I, watch I, pr- I agree the prom. with you. That's what I'm saying. I was Jesus. also wondering how she had time to go to work ever. Like, they still showed her at the office when she was, like, quote-unquote undercover. Well, I mean, they portray her, her copyating gig as, like, get me this one piece done by 5 p.m., which is not how, even in the 1990s when there were far less content, how anything works. Like, she doesn't have anything to do, yeah. so she can has time to go to high school. I know, but then just the, the scheduling. How did she get to the office by five? I got the vibe a lot of people left work at five at the, <laughs> yes, there. It's true. So I just didn't make sense to me. I have no idea. Just really very strange. Next category. Best quote. Not a lot to pick uh, from here. Let's skip. <laughs> I mean, the There's only no one quotes. is I'm not Josie Grossy anymore. That's it. No, scream it. I'm not Josie Grossy anymore. I remember that one. And her just so, yelling, I'm not Josie Grossy anymore. Done. Okay, Next one. Great. Could this work as a 10 episode Netflix yes. show? Yeah. So Zoe and I talked about this and I was just like, would you watch this? It's a show. And she's like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it, it would be. Weird. Yeah. It That's would, actually a really good idea a good for show. a Netflix show. It would be good. But what would be the premise? Because there's a statutory rapey kind of right. element that could not be in that anymore. So how do you do this? I think you, I would suggest changing it so that it's like um, someone who goes starting college who like has never like no experience at all. What if they came to the high school as an 18 year old? Like a PG mm, year? Still, yeah, like a PG year. But I think it's still it's tough from a power dynamic with teachers. And also that really complicates if you're 18, your interaction with high school students. I think you just have to take out the romantic element and make it about self-discovery. Yes. It That's has- what it is. And like learning how to fit in and whatever yourself. And then you would make the romantic element be an adult who has nothing to do with the school. And so the Josie character is lying. Is She's in an ad- adult consenting relationship as an adult, but is lying to this person about her assignment. And then she's also like having all these personal revelations at high school. And so all the high school kids, when they find out that she's old, feel really betrayed. And she hopefully gets into some legal trouble. And then the adult person that she's in an adult relationship with is like, what are you doing? You've been lying to me. And also, this is really weird. And that would be the crisis. Well, the other thing would be she gets thrown into this high school and there's all these dynamics now Mm -hmm. going to high school with like gender identity and all these things, pronouns and things like she would be like fish out of water with all that stuff. Yeah. All right, I mean, we, the way to make it work is the person's like 35 pretending to be an 18-year-old. 
And she's just completely out of the loop with everything that's going on. But looks young. It's kind of like, did you ever watch Summer Heights High on HBO? It's one of my favorite shows. No. But was this, Deshaun Hardell in it? No. <laughs> it's an Australian sitcom where this, it's so offensive, where this guy is like, 40 plays like all of these high school students and it's just like obvious that he's not high school whatever Netflix bring it back I have a probably unanswerable question okay if she's 18 and not 17 in this movie is it okay no for the for the te- for the teacher to like her legally yes but still really creepy not okay like you don't want that to be your teacher yeah I I don't think I think it's still weird because it's I mean the answer is it's still weird Right. I mean, but that's he thing. knows she's 17, which is now not legal. Unless they're in just, Mississippi, which we know really they're not. I think, like, anytime you have to be like, are you 18? Yeah. You know? It's that's tough. not good. Just, like, take a step back. It's a stay away. I will say, I hesitate even doing this, but I have to. <sighs> the, the late 90s, you could have made this as a, what's the most 1999 thing about this movie? Because the late 90s really was kind of like this, where... There was an Anna Kornikova countdown clock and yep, shit like that. And, that. and the Olsons as It's well. like, yeah, and the Olsons, can't wait till they're 18, was like a thing. And it was during the Maxim era and all right. that stuff where it was just the way we talked about stuff back then. So I don't, I mean, it, it just is, it didn't jump out as much, I don't think, in 1999. Yeah. I think that it, it was less of a Making falling. a fair point. Right, yeah. Um, 17, he'd be like, man, I can't wait till you're 18. Oh, yes. <laughs> My, my unanswerable question is, did John C. Riley and Molly Shannon uh, end up dating in this movie? Like, are those- I, Well, they're holding hands at the end. Are they? Yeah, at, uh, the, at the baseball scene. Oh, I missed so that. So I think you're supposed to think that, like, you I think know, I love conquers all then. for what's, all. What's the next hour look like for them after the picture <laughs> mound kiss? Like, dinner? Yeah, I think so. Because she's, like, she's pretty buttoned up. And she'll just be like, we should, like, go get to know each other. And he, you know, he likes her mind. So- I had one more unanswerable question, but it's more of a nitpick. How does she not kiss anybody? I don't know. Like, unless there's a thing where, you know, she was 530 pounds up until a year before or had yeah. some di- skin disease that she couldn't have contact her. Drew Barrymore is going to go through high school and college. Nobody's going to try to kiss her at any point. No self-esteem, no confidence, you know? Got to put yourself out there. Kissing though, it's yeah, not. This I, isn't virginity. This is like there's not <laughs> one night at some point somebody's like that girl's cute. I'm gonna make a run at her. I just I don't think that she's going to those parties. Also, they didn't develop this plot at all. They yeah. just like dropped the. It's just ludicrous. It. Well, yeah, I agree. They didn't set it up at all. It's ridiculous. We all agree. There's no development. There's no emotional or character development. Never in been this film. kissed. It's like that's almost impossible. Well, she does say in the in the, in the high school or no in the personal essay. For my first real kiss. She also, in this speech, is, like, the speech makes the distinction, the original one, when they're at the lunch table, between, like, kissing and the magical kiss where you know you've met the person yeah. you want to spend the rest of your life with, which I'm not sure I have had that kiss still, and I'm married, <laughs> so. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that but instantly. That's maybe it should be called. You don't know in one lightning moment. That's all. Right. I'm, I, so it should be called Never Had the Right Kiss. Never Had the Real yeah, Kiss. Okay. Yeah. That's not quite Never as, Had the Right Kiss. Yeah, not as great. Not as, not as catchy. catchy. Do the right kiss. Um, I just feel like somebody's making a move on Drew Barrymore at some point in the first 25 years of her life. It's I agree happening. with you. Agreed. Um, who on the movie? Mike. Michael Vartan, right? Yeah. I mean, I, can you, does this count as winning he, that we think he's cute at the end of it? And he goes on to have a He's a, a statutory career. rapist. I'm going to say I know. he didn't that's, win it. I know. That's why I'm like, is it winning? Do Drew Barrymore doesn't win to, this movie. Does he want to be asked about it right now? I think no. Does Michael Vartan, the actor or the character guy? Uh, both. I think Michael Vartan, the actor, this launches him as like a hot guy. And then he is like known as a hot mm-hmm. guy for a few years. So yeah. that's a win. Yeah. I mean, you could honestly say Drew Barrymore probably won the movie. This It made $84 million yeah, bucks. Yeah. Roger Ebert gave it three stars, and it paved the next 10 years of her career. And, people and it was her own production song, like, company, all that true. stuff. I I personally feel like Deshaun Hardell was the winner because he's really good in every scene. He's the only one who's forgetting the perfect version of him. But it's probably Drew Barrymore, Okay, unfortunately. A pyrrhic victory. For playing somebody who seems brain damaged <laughs> half the movie. <laughs> I'm going to go with Michael Vartan. I'm sticking okay. with it. Okay. All right. Great. Fair enough. Uh, Bill, Amanda, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Rewatchables 1999 presented by Luminary Media. We'll be back next week with another iconic film from 1999. Until then...